We have for you today the next in our summer school series, which is co-sponsored by DC BARS Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources section. And today we have the Law and Policy of Products Regulation, which looks at TOSCA and FIFRA. The wonderful presenter that we have today, uh, Lynn Bergeson, is the Partner and Managing <coughs> Director of Bergeson & Campbell, which is a boutique law firm in Washington, D.C. that focuses on chemical regulation. She counsels clients on issues pertaining to chemical hazard, exposure, and risk assessment and risk communication and has earned an international reputation in the legal and regulatory aspects of conventional and nanoscale chemical regulatory programs under TOSCA, BIFRA, and the European Union's REACH program. And she's also worked on issues pertinent to nanotechnology and other emerging transformative technologies. And so with that, I will turn it over to Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. My pleasure and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone on the phone. Um, what I would like to do is just explain a little bit about my background so you understand exactly where I'm coming from. And then we're going to talk very generally about product regulation so there's a context. And then we'll go immediately into TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is the federal law that regulates all aspects of industrial chemicals. And then quickly pivot over to FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, the Pesticide Law, and then we'll open it up to me. But if you all have questions in the interim on clarifications or if I'm not clear on something, just shoot your hand up and we'll go over it because folks on the phone may similarly be yet disadvantaged. Um, as Chandra said, I am a lawyer. I've been practicing in this space for about three decades. Didn't start out there, but as chemical regulatory law and policy has matured, there's been much more activity on the interface of law, science, and policy, all of which is what Task and FIFRA are all about. And for all of you on the phone and in the room that are policy mavens, this is a fabulous area of the law because there's no greater confluence of issues than the regulation of chemicals, industrial and pesticide, and how those regulations respond to the fast evolving science that we have, and of course new awareness at every level. Physicians, consumers, and all other stakeholders have with regard to what chemicals, the benefits they offer, and the potential harm they may pose unless they are managed in a way that is prudent and safe, okay? So um, what we do is largely represent international industrial chemical manufacturers and pesticide manufacturers, and increasingly um, representing companies that are making chemicals at the nanoscale for improved functionalities, um, and also uh, representing a lot of people that are now taking bio-based materials, corn and soy, and eliminating the need for fossil fuel-based chemicals and, and using those as uh, both uh, chemicals, biochemicals, and fuels. So there's just an awful lot going on, and for those of you that are interested in this area of the law, there's no dearth of interesting issues. And for those of you that are here largely just to get a big overview of how the federal government, we're only gonna be focusing on the federal government now, manages industrial and pesticide chemicals, this is a good overview. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, I want to ease up on the legal stuff and try to focus on big picture topics, and um, if, if you want to do a drill down in any particular area, we'll, we'll go for it. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> As I said, we're going to be focusing largely on two federal laws. Uh, TOSCA, which regulates industrial chemicals, and FIFRA, as it's called, not FUFRA, and not FIFRA, it's FIFRA, uh, which regulates pesticides. And we'll, we'll, by the time you end today, you will know the difference between an industrial chemical and what's a pesticide, okay? Both laws are risk-benefit, which means because of the nature of the beast, because chemicals sometimes by their very nature, particularly pesticides, which are intended to kind of kill something, pose a risk, but if the benefit of that chemical in a particular application is believed to trump the potential risk, it will be allowed to stay. 
And we'll get into that in a little bit, but just it, it's important to keep in mind that it's not zero risk, it's not you have to demonstrate that a chemical is safe at every speed. It's a risk-benefit statute which has many different um, legal implications. What we're going to talk about today is just a very small kind of slice of the pie. There's there are a bunch of other laws that impact product regulation. I just wanted to do a little parachute in on that so you know that we're, um, which one is the, uh, is it the middle one? The, the back one or the laser? The laser. It's the middle one. Okay, okay. All right, we're not going to talk about um, transport laws, which deal with the transportation of chemicals. There are laws that specifically regulate consumer products, so that the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, the Federal Hazardous Substance Act, and the Hazardous Substances and Household Products. These are all other laws that are not administered by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, but nonetheless are important if you're thinking of the regulation of products. We're talking about chemical products, but there are consumer products, for example, that the Consumer Product Safety Commission administers, and those are these. Even the Department of Homeland Security, particularly since uh, post 9-11, gets into the act um, in regulating uh, federal security um, and, and facilities that are believed to pose high risk because of the presence of chemicals. And under the Department of Homeland Security and the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, uh, owners and operators of facilities are required to engage in site vulnerability analyses and site security plans to ensure that the chemicals that are staged there are, are staged in a way that present no risk to either the people at the plant or those living around it. But these are other laws that we're not going to talk about anymore. Things are very twitchy. Yeah, it is. This is a very sensitive. <laughs> um, I think I actually passed over, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, there, are, in addition to Tosca and FIFRA, which really does deal with the, the NEAT chemical and NEAT, N-E-A-T, is a term that people use when they're talking about a specific chemical. So the, the pure chemical, there are two federal laws that that uh, we're going to be talking about. These other federal laws deal with other aspects of a manufacturing process and really deal with byproducts. So we kind of bucket them and, and call them chemical byproduct laws. The Clean Air Act, the stuff going up the chute um, or the, uh, the stack or um, uh, emissions that are coming out of roof vents, those are considered chemical byproducts, but they're not regulated by TOSCA or FIFRA because they are regulated under the Clean Air Act. Interestingly, though, there is, see that third line there, um, the regulation of fuels and fuel additives. There's a very narrow area under the Clean Air Act called uh, Section 211 that specifically regulates fuel additive products. So it's often overlooked, but it's embedded in another federal statute that we're not going to talk about. But again, it's a chemical product that is subject to a, a discrete set of regulations under the Clean Air that we're not going to address. Clean Water Act, you all know that that regulates discharges to water on the direct or indirect, and the Safe Drinking Water Act, which again regulates other aspects of materials that are considered byproducts, not chemical products, and are regulated under federal law. Uh, also, um, there's chemical waste and disposal laws. Again, these are aspects of, of chemicals that are regulated, but as a byproduct waste of a manufacturing process. Obviously, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act deals with ongoing waste that's generated at manufacturing facilities, and CERCLA deals with historic waste that um, is a, a byproduct of the manufacturing process. And of course, there are other workplace laws that we're not going to go into that regulate chemicals in the workplace that might expose workers to particular hazards. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and EPA work very closely together in areas that we'll talk about with regard to exposure risks in the workplace when you're manufacturing or processing chemicals. But again, just wanted you to be aware that our little slice of the pie here is really pretty narrow, but within that, the world of Tosca and FIFRA have very specific uh, 
overarching chemical regulatory regimes. I'm going to try to give you a sense of today. Okay, we did that already. Okay, now we're going to go to Tosca. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions on what we're not going to talk about? No. Okay. All right. The Toxic Substances Control Act was signed by Congress and, and um, entered into law in what year? Anyone take a guess? 1976. 1976. It is far older than most of you. <laughs> and it hasn't substantively been amended in any meaningful way with regard to the core provisions of chemical management since its enactment. Don't you find that an astonishing proposition? Given all of the changes in chemical production, all of the new technologies, Tosca has never been amended. Some people, such as myself, credit the original drafters of the law as it being very elegant, far-reaching, and elastic because it anticipates many new technologies like biotechnology, synthetic nanotechnology, synbio, and what have you. Others, detractors, which we'll get into, say, you know what, Tosca is old, it no longer reflects the current science and it needs to be amended. That's why some of you may be aware of congressional activity focusing on TOSCA reauthorization, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Well, what does TOSCA regulate? It regulates anything that is defined to be a chemical substance. And it's a very broad term. And it includes just about everything except mixtures, pesticides, because Pesticides are regulated under FIFRA. Food additives, because food additives are regulated under the uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act by the Food and Drug Administration, drugs, cosmetics, or devices. So it's, it's easier to, find, to define what a TOSCA covers by identifying what is specifically excluded. And then anything that's left is cut subject to TOSCA. Now what about this mixture thing? Does that mean if you have chemical A and chemical B, if it's mixed up together, it's not subject to regulation? No. Chemical A is subject to regulation under TOSCA. Chemical B is subject to regulation under TOSCA. And when you put them in a bowl and mix it up, the gamish is not subject to TOSCA. But the two individual substances are subject to TOSCA. And if a third chemical or even a fourth chemical is produced, when you mix it up, that gamish, those two new substances are subject to TOSCA. So very little escapes regulation of the TOSCA. And as I said, what is that, that mixture thing? It's any combination of two or more chemical substances if the combination does not occur in nature and is not in whole or in part the result of a chemical reaction. What you need to think about here is that sometimes people say, oh, but mixtures aren't covered by TOSCA. That's because the individual components are, okay? Um, also, it's important to appreciate that both TOSCA and FIFRA are kind of um, intent statutes. If you have a chemical substance and it might have what we'll talk about later, a pesticidal property, in other words, it's a chemical that when you expose it to mosquitoes, mosquitoes die. But you don't intend that result. You're using it in an industrial application there are certain what we call dual use chemicals. A chemical might have a specific intent by a manufacturer to serve a specific industrial application. If, however, it also has pesticidal applications, simply by virtue of the way the chemical, the chemical's DNA, then it also could be considered a pesticide. And what distinguishes the two is the intent that you are trying to use. Remember, a billion years ago, none of you guys was born, but a billion years ago, um, a door-to-door -door company called Avon had a product called SkinSoSol, and everybody knew that if you applied SkinSoSol, it had the effect of deterring mosquitoes. So it acted as kind of a an insecticide, but it wasn't marketed as such. But because everybody, wink, wink, nod, nod, knew that it had that property, and in fact, some of the literature that the salespeople were using represented that it had this pesticidal product, but it wasn't registered by EPA. They quickly were stopped by EPA from making representations regarding a pesticidal product or, or functionality that was not registered with EPA. So the, the bottom line there is that chemicals can sometimes be an industrial chemical, 
can sometimes be a pesticide, and it depends upon the intent. Okay. Did I go too far? Yep, I did. Okay, who's subject to Tosca? Persons are also very broadly defined. Any manufacturer, you're making a chemical, you're subject to Tosca. You're importing a chemical. There's a lot of offshore production these days in Asia, uh, a lot in Asia. Europe, you can have uh, chemical manufacturing any place in the world. If it comes into the territorial US of A, you are considered functionally a manufacturer. So if you make it here or you make it there, you're going to be subject to Tosca. So manufacturer is defined to mean to produce or manufacture in the U.S. or import into the customs territory of the United <coughs> States. And it really includes just about anyone um, in, in the value chain, like importers and manufacturers. Now, processors is a very broad term that is, is not well defined under the law, but it's um, any entity that might be uh, further processing a chemical, readying it for, for production um, or distribution in Congress, uh, in, in a commerce, uh, it could be blending, it could be just further refinement, you're processing a chemical. You're going to be subject to certain provisions of Tosca, as noted here, and we'll go through a little bit of these provisions. But at the end of the day, the folks that are really interested in Tosca include, historically, manufacturers and importers. More recently, as Tosca has matured, as EPA's understanding of chemicals and routes of exposure, much more of the value chain between the time a chemical is produced at a, a manufacturing facility and then further distributed for processing and then ultimately its inclusion in a product and its distribution into commerce as, a, as an article or some manufactured consumer good, uh, many more people are now much more aware of Tosca and the need to be mindful of their obligations under the law. But historically, it's really been manufacturers and importers, but that's changing a lot. Okay. Tosca inventory. How many of you ever have heard of the inventory? It, it's, it's a very important concept under Tosca. And the reason it's important because it is a very big line in the sand. Back when the law was first um, signed into law, okay, thanks. Um, in 1976, EPA started implementing the law by issuing regulations. And one of the regulations it implemented was under uh, Tosca Section 8, which required that chemicals in commerce back in the late 70s be notified to EPA. Because what EPA was trying to do was get a sense of how many chemicals are out there in commerce. EPA had no earthly idea when the law was passed. It could have been 6,000, it could have been 600,000. So people that were subject to the law were asked to submit information to EPA so it could compile this long list of chemicals. And that's the Tosca Section 8 inventory of chemical substances. So the current inventory consists of all of the chemicals that were notified to EPA back in the late eight, uh, 70s and every chemical that has subsequently been added to the inventory because it went from being a new chemical substance, which we'll talk about, to an existing chemical substance. So the law of chemical substances is broadly defined to include existing chemical substances that are listed on the inventory and new chemical substances that are not. And once EPA completes a process of reviewing a new chemical substance, it is added onto the inventory and it magically and metaphorically ceases being a new chemical substance and becomes an existing one. There are maybe 65,000 or so, 65 or 85, I forget. I think it's closer to 65, uh, 67,000 chemicals on the inventory. And the important thing to remember when we talk about Tosca reform is, well, okay, back in 1979, before any of you was born, what was the significance of submitting your chemical to EPA and getting it on this big inventory? The significance is this term here, grandfathered. 
once your chemical was listed on the inventory, it was considered an existing chemical substance and essentially was not further reviewed for human health and environmental risk. It simply was listed on the inventory, assumed the status of an existing chemical substance, and became grandfathered. So EPA did not independently, then or since, review the chemical substance with a sense of determining whether it had toxicological potencies or exposure opportunities or environmental fate properties that might cause EPA to be concerned about its continued use, okay? So that's the long and short of the existing inventory, the, uh, the initial inventory, and where it is today. Okay, now new chemical review. Under TSCA, the whole object of the exercise is to give EPA an opportunity to know, review, and essentially confirm that a, a new chemical substance is appropriate for use and distribution in the United States. So this Section 5 of TSCA enables EPA and grants it authority to do that. Section 5 authorizes EPA to review activities associated with the manufacture, processing, use, and disposal of any new chemical substance before it enters the marketplace. So this is, this is a critically important point. If you're a chemical manufacturer, you have a brand new chemical substance. You've got a patent on it. No one else has this chemical substance. If it is not on the inventory, it is considered new. And if it's considered new, unless you fall into certain exemptions from this EPA new chemical review process, you must submit to EPA a very long form called a pre-manufacture notification and obtain EPA's review of that chemical substance and it's the information submitted to EPA as a predicate to commercialization. And when I counsel chemical producers who are totally unaware, many of which might be offshore, of TSCA, it's like, well, what do you mean? I'm, I'm all ready to go here. I've got a brand new chemical substance. I have purchasers. I've got product lines. I've got my marketing ready to go. And it's like, no, time out, time out, time out. EPA has to review that chemical. And TSCA Section 5 gives it the authority to do so. And if you manufacture or enter into commerce a new chemical substance without having it listed on the TSCA inventory and without going through this pre-manufacture review process, you are going to be in significant legal jeopardy. This is very important. TSCA Section 5 also authorizes EPA under certain circumstances that we'll talk a little bit about to regulate existing chemical substances with what is called a significant new use rule or SNR. So again, existing substances listed on the inventory, if a chemical is listed on the inventory, you're good to go. You do not need to get EPA pre-approval. It's considered an existing substance and you can market it and do whatever you want for the most part. There are other little bells and whistles under the inventory that I'm not going to go into because it's very confusing, but the bottom line is that if it's an existing chemical substance, because it is listed on the inventory, you don't need any EPA further review to market, distribute, process, or otherwise go into business, okay? If it's not listed on the TSCA inventory, and there are two inventories, public inventory that you can access by going to the EPA website and a confidential inventory that is not subject to e uh, public review and I'll tell you how you can figure out if the chemical is listed on the confidential inventory but at the end of the day if your, your chemical is not listed on the inventory you don't see the CASRI number or other identifier listed on this publicly available website you're considered presumptively new, and you have to go through the new chemical review process. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Let me look at There was a question here. The que there was a question uh, that was sent in via email, which what happens with chemicals that are more toxic as mixtures than their component parts? <laughs> If the individual constituents are regulated not as harmful, what happens with the mixture 
that is more toxic by the reaction of two constituents. That's a very complicated, very interesting area of the law. As we said, TSCA regulates individual chemical substances and not the mixture per se. If that mixture generates a new chemical substance that is not the same constituent as A or B or C or how many other individual chemical components went into the gamish, it it's, itself is considered a new chemical substance. If there's no chemical reaction going on and simply the gamish might be inherently more toxic than the sum of its parts, or the sum of its parts is more toxic than each of the individual components, you might have a product stewardship issue on your hands, but you don't necessarily have a TSCA regulatory issue on your hands, okay? There are other aspects of the law that might address how that mixture needs to be managed. If it's a consumer product, for example, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has regulations that, that would um, step in. If the Department of Transportation, depending upon the mixture, if it poses risk during transport, special management regulations under DOT regulations, um, there, so there, the bottom line to the answer is here is it's not really a TSCA regulatory issue, but as a good product steward, you certainly would want to be aware of what the various component parts of a mixture, what they might coalesce to, to present in, by way of a potential risk to human health or the environment, especially if you're marketing that product. And if you're aware of that information, you might have disclosure obligations and certainly product stewardship obligations, but you may not have TSCA regulatory issues per se, okay? All right. Now, if I thoroughly confuse you, I'm trying to drill down just a couple of key points here, which is when is a chemical substance existing listed on the inventory? When is it new? You don't see the chemical on the inventory and you have to obtain EPA approval first. Now, there's another process that you can pursue with EPA to determine if your brand new chemical substance is on this private confidential inventory. And this happens all the time. We, we are approached, a company will say, well, I don't know if this substance is on the inventory because it's not on the publicly available one. What we might do is look on the inventories of other international authorities, Europe, China, Japan, Canada, and if it's on a bunch of other inventories and intuitively you have reason to think that it might be a well-known chemical substance, you can perhaps speculate that it's on the private inventory. But in order to determine it's on the private confidential inventory, you have to submit it in what is called a bona fide submission to EPA where you ask the agency essentially that you're going to be marketing this chemical and you don't know if it's on the inventory, and EPA will tell you by virtue of its response to that submission if it is in fact already listed on the private inventory. But you, you just can't call, you know, pick up the phone and call EPA and say, golly, here's the CAS number, which is Chemical Abstract Service, it's a chemical identifier number. Is it on the inventory or not? The EPA cannot by law tell you that. You have to go through this process. But the important take home message is there is a process that you can elicit that information from the government. Yes? Uh, what's the purpose of having the confidential uh, list? The question is what is the purpose of having a confidential inventory? As you can imagine, the manufacture of highly specialized proprietary chemical substances raises all types of competitive and confidential business information. I use these terms very loosely, but pixie dust. You've just spent $2 million manufacturing a brand new molecule. So you don't necessarily want to have all that information publicly available through the, the, the public inventory. Uh, more mature chemicals that have been around a while and there's no patent or any type of uh, protection it becomes less less of an issue, but there are legitimate interests that Congress was plainly aware of back in 19, the mid-70s when it allowed for confidential treatment of not just the chemical identity, but also properties relating to and other forms of information associated with the manufacture of chemical substances. Now, EPA's policies with respect to the management and, and um, recognition of certain categories of information of, as being confidential and not available for public review has changed a lot over time because you've got confidential business information 
concerns going down this line, and you've got right to know and the public's legitimate interest in knowing what chemicals they may be exposed to on this line, and eventually they, they hit a collision course. So the agency has done a very good job of balancing the need to protect proprietary information, to protect innovation, to protect and spur investment in research and development, while at the same time providing the public with sufficient information to understand and prepare for and mitigate potential risks. Okay. Oogie dooks. Now this task of section five, SNR stuff, um, the point here is that usually you think of task of section five as new chemicals. And then I just said, but well, wait a minute, you can have a new chemical or the agency can review an existing chemical under section five too. EPA can identify what it considers a new use of an existing chemical and subject it to special restrictions. And the agency has been using its SNR, Significant New Use Rule Authority, a lot lately, in large part because the agency's authority under TSCA to regulate existing chemicals, not new, but the chemicals that were grandfathered back in the late 70s, the agency is exploring its authority under TSC in new, innovative, and very elastic ways. So the agency is trying to identify and carve out new uses of old chemicals, existing chemicals, and saying, if you use this chemical in this way, which might be a volumetric limit, it might be um, a different form of the chemical, it might be any number of definitions of new the agency will assert its authority under TSCA Section 5 and regulate and control those uses as though it were a new chemical, but it's an old chemical with a new use. Okay? All right. Now, we talked a little bit about what's the process for getting a chemical on the inventory, because that's what a big part of, of TSCA is, is you've got a new chemical. Your job is to change it from being a new chemical to an existing chemical. So you get it on the inventory, and it then will be considered you know, part of the mix. The PMN is the, is the way you do that. The pre-manufacture notification, if you just go to EPA's website, you put in PMN, you will see the electronic version of the form. It requires a lot of information that is intuitive. Who's producing it? What the chemical structure is? What are the properties associated with it? Is it corrosive? You know, what, what do you know about this chemical? And EPA looks at all that information. It also elicits information about what you might be doing with it. Where is it going? Are workers going to be exposed to it? How is it going to be manufactured? Uh, what emissions might be generated during the production process? Is stuff going up the chute? Is there going to be a water discharge associated with the manufacture of the chemical? All of these issues that, that are legitimate areas of inquiry for EPA to make a determination as to whether this new chemical is going to pose risk. And the agency's review of chemicals over the years and its new chemicals division, EPA, has done a very good job of looking at chemicals and analyzing them with a view toward trying to assess what potential risks these chemicals might pose. And as you can imagine, the interest in chemicals today is far more intense than it was 20, 10 years ago. Everybody seems to be interested in chemicals now, whether it's the chemicals in this plastic bottle or the chemicals emitted in off-gassing in carpets or paints or anything to which consumers and others that are unprotected might be exposed. So the agency elicits this information and it has several different things that it can do in response. Uh, the agency can look at the PMN application, which it must do, by the way, within 90 days of the submission of the, the PMN. So. On day one, you've submitted your pre-manufacture notification and you submit it always to EPA headquarters. There's no delegation of TSCA. Everything is done here in Washington. So you submit the PMN, it's all done electronically, and on day one, the agency has a very well-established review process. And if, for those of you who are interested in this, I urge you to look at the EPA website because it's very well-defined. There are various subgroups that look at aspects of the chemical, the environmental aspects, the biological human health aspects, uh, and, and other forms of the, uh, of the chemical. EPA can look at all the information that it has before it and either determine that the 
chemical is good to go and it will impose no restrictions. The chemical is pretty pretty okay, but we're going to impose some restrictions because we're concerned about X, Y, or Z. Uh, or it can say, you know what, this chemical is not meeting our standards and we are not going to approve it. And you can withdraw the PMN or acquiesce and engage in a negotiation with EPA to identify what is driving the concern. Is there additional information the manufacturer can submit to EPA to eliminate or mitigate those concerns? Or are there ways that we can revise our manufacturing process to eliminate a concern? Or can we diminish the amount of the chemical that we were thinking of making to eliminate these concerns? So it's not like it's an all or nothing proposition. You really do engage with EPA scientists to un identify what the concern is and see if there are ways that you can mitigate the concern by modifying the manufacturing process, diminishing the amount of the chemical, or engaging in other types of analyses that will address that concern. And EPA scientists do a very good job of telling you what the concern is and exploring ways to get to yes. Their job is not to say, you know, hell no, there's no way this chemical is ever going to be manufactured. It's to ensure that the standard that the agency has under TSCA is met and that innovation can continue in ways that are protective of human health and the environment. And the EPA scientists here at Washington really do a fabulous job. They've developed very interesting, innovative methodologies that um, enable the agency to assess new chemicals, even if there is very little toxicological data associated with them, which is a big deal. As we'll talk about under FIFRA, under the pesticide law, you are required as a condition of pre-market manufacture of developing copious amounts of data. So uh, FIFRA is a very data-rich statute. Under FIFRA, you are not required under current law to establish a minimum data set. You're required to really explore what chemical you have before you. You don't have to be able to report that you have a two-generation reproductive toxicity study associated with this chemical. You may or you may not. If you have the data, you need to share it with EPA. But you are not required to submit data to EPA in order to get your chemical approved. So question for you guys. You have no information on a particular chemical substance. All you know is that you want to produce it. It's not on the task inventory. You've submitted a PMN and you, and you filed it. What do you think EPA does when it gets that information? Anybody? What does the agency do to determine whether or not a brand new chemical substance is capable of presenting toxicological risk to human health and the environment? What EPA has done, it is, is looked at chemicals and developed various methodologies for looking at whether or not the chemical structure is similar to other chemicals for which it may have data. So structural activity relationship methodologies, SAR analyses, is a, is a way that the agency has been able to move forward even in the absence of specific data on a specific chemical. Similarly, the agency has identified categories of chemicals and groups of chemicals that are believed to behave similarly because they're structured similarly. So there are ways the agency has very creatively used the resources that it has to review and approve chemicals even in the absence of specific information on them, okay? Now, we went through what are the options. The EPA can allow the chemical, it can put some restrictions on it, or it can say, nope, nope, not gonna approve this one, go back. Let's say the 90th day rolls around on your PMN, your, and literally this does happen. We'll prepare PMNs, we'll submit them to the EPA, we'll check from time to time, we'll call the scientists the EPA, and we'll say, haven't heard anything, no news is definitely good news here. On the 90th day, you still haven't heard anything, are you good to go? Can you begin import and manufacture? If you have heard nothing from EPA on the 90th day, it comes and goes, you can presume that your chemical has been, has cleared the Tosca gauntlet. Does that get your chemical on the inventory? No. And this is something that a lot of people kind of forget. You have to submit 
a notice of commencement within 30 days of the first manufacturer import. And it's the submission of the NOC that actually gets your chemical substance listed on the TASCA inventory, and you cease being a new chemical and turn into an existing one. Okay? So that's the process very, very quickly that goes from the new to existing, and it's this submission of an NOC that actually gets your chemical substance on the inventory. Okay? For those of you not here, I'm having a hard time manipulating the clicker. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, it is 85,000. I misspoke. Again, this Tosca inventory, which is the combination of all the grandfather chemicals that were listed back in the late 70s, and every single new chemical that has gone from being a new to an existing one is now on the, the uh, Tosca inventory, and there are now between 85 and 90,000 substances listed. You, that's a number you hear frequently by detractors of Tosca because they will say, you know, there are 90,000 chemicals on the Tosca substances uh, list, many of which have never been reviewed by EPA. Well, that's true. Many of them have not, but that number is probably really grossly inflated because a lot of those chemicals might have been at one point in commerce but are no longer. A lot of people will put chemical substances on the inventory and cease and desist using them. So the number of chemical substances actually in commerce is probably significantly less than 85,000. Could be as, as low as 40 to 45,000. And I'm not trying to diminish the whole grandfathered issue. I'm simply saying that this number is not a reflection in any accurate way of the actual number of chemical substances in commerce. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, I'm wondering what triggers the significant new use rules uh, clause because if, what if there's an existing chemical and then there's new data that shows that this chemical may have endocrine disrupting properties or other toxic properties that were not made or not discovered during an initial chemical assessment? The question is what triggers the agency's significant new use rule authority and embedded in this gentleman's question is if an existing chemical is later found to pose certain environmental or human health risks, what authorizes the agency to address those risks? If you can bear with me for just a little bit, we'll sure. get there. <coughs> All right, we talked about new and existing. How, how many of those 90,000 are on the original list? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the original was probably somewhere in the 65,000. And EPA probably maintains these stats, but mm -hmm. like whether or not there have been since the late 90s some 20,000 chemicals that have gone through the PMN process and again submitted the PMN, the NOC has been filed, and oops, it goes on the, I think that's probably about right. It, we're going to move here into the task, break down the TOSCE inventory a little bit, which is uh, the TOSCE inventory is maintained under Section 8 of TOSCE, which is kind of informally referred to as the record keeping and reporting provision, because there are a number of authorities that EPA has under TOSCE 8 to obtain information from regulated entities. I'm just quickly going to go through these because it enables us to then pivot <coughs> off of this into the answer to the question the uh, gentleman raised a minute ago. Uh, information and collection of information on existing chemicals is an extremely important function that EPA has, and it's one of the ways this gentleman's question is answered. EPA has authority under TOSCA Section 8 to ask for, collect, uh, for uh, production use and exposure information via a rulemaking, that means you'll wake up one morning, look in the Federal Register, and EPA will have issued what is called a PAIR rule, Preliminary Assessment Information Rule, asking for certain information on a particular chemical. And if you represent chemical companies, as I do, and if you see that the agency is soliciting information on a particular chemical or class of chemicals, what does intuitively that tell you? That the agency has reason to believe that there might be something that it needs to explore with respect to that chemical or class of chemicals because it's asking for information on it. Um, there's another uh, very important chemical data reporting rule called the CDR that is in play right now where the agency in intervals of four years requires companies 
to report production, use, and exposure information on substances over a certain threshold. This is a periodic reporting obligation. It, before uh, the recent pass, this was called the inventory update rule. So any chemical substance listed on the inventory, producers were required, if you meet a certain volumetric amount per facility, to submit information on it, which is the agency's way of trying to keep tabs on who's doing what. It's a completely sensible, logical reporting requirement and a very important one. Um, the, the program has been expanded significantly um, in the recent past, and this reporting cycle, which is under review or ongoing right now, um, is requiring a very significant amount of information that will enable EPA to understand better what chemicals are in commerce, at what production amounts, what's being imported, and where do these chemicals go once they are produced, to what types of uses and applications do they go into. So the purpose of this reporting function, according to EPA, is to collect quality screening level exposure related information on chemical substances and to make that information available for use by EPA and to the extent possible uh, to the public. You can submit claims of confidentiality as to certain categories of information, but this CDR, the Chemical Data Reporting Rule, is a very important reporting function that enables EPA to elicit information and make important determinations regarding whether or not additional information might be needed. Plus, because all of this information is submitted electronically this year for the first year, it will quickly go on the internet and be available, assuming it hasn't been claimed confidential, for consumer uh, entities, public health activists, and your competitors to see. So a lot of information here, um, a lot of reporting obligations, and uh, because this is the first time this new rule that has been recently expanded has gone into effect, we'll, we'll be very interested uh, to see where this information um, ends up. 8C is another reporting obligation. Companies must retain an allegation of an adverse effect and submit them to EPA upon request. So if you have a worker or a, a entity that might be living in and, in and around your, your plant site, makes a certain allegation that it caused an adverse health effect. You don't need to submit that information to EPA, but you need to retain an allegation of it in a, in a file. So if EPA asks for it, you can um, submit it to the agency. And why, if you're a good product steward, would you want to retain that information? If you see a pattern of adverse effects, either a skin rash or some sort of you know adverse effect, whatever it may be, nausea or uh, lightness of, of head or rapid um, tachycardia or some effect, if you're a good product steward, you want to record that information and respond to it. So it's a, a very important reporting obligation that you, you maintain records and if EPA asks for it, you submit it. 8D is another very important uh, reporting obligation if you are subject to TSCA. The agency can ask for any data that you have in your files or are aware of with respect to ongoing or existing studies via a rulemaking. So EPA will issue what is called an 8D rule in the Federal Register and it will compel the submission of whatever type of information the EPA is asking for. And again, these are, these are signals if you're subject to TSCA. If you see that the agency is compelling the submission of data on a chemical or a class of chemicals, it usually means that there are certain impacts that the agency is concerned about that may wish to learn more about. So these information gathering authorities that EPA has is one way it obtains information that might lead EPA to conclude that certain chemicals that are in existence now are posing the types of risks that it might need to deploy its authority under other sections of TSCA to address. Okay. What happens if EPA gets this information under a pair rule, the TSCA Chemical Data Reporting Rule, HC allegations, human health and safety studies. Oh, and I neglected to mention this 8E. 8E is a 
adverse effects reporting requirement, if you are, have information that would lead a person to conclude that there is certain an adverse effect of which the agency is unaware, and there are many different exceptions in reporting bells and whistles, but end of the day, the AE reporting function is an important one that causes you immediately to report to EPA certain adverse effects that haven't already been disclosed to the agency. And by immediate, they mean as quickly as possible and certainly no more than 30 calendar days. So if all of this information gets funneled in the EPA through any one of these buckets, what can EPA do? What has authority under TSCA Section 4 to require manufacturers to conduct additional testing on chemicals that are believed to pose a problem. And the agency has discharged that authority in years past. It will issue what is called the Section 4 test rule. And the test rule might include certain toxicological testing, um, immunological testing, bioassays for cancer, reproductive toxicity, inhalation, uh, any, t any nature of tests that the agency believes is necessary to further assess whether a chemical is believed to pose risks that are unacceptable under TSCA. There haven't been a lot of these, and many of them that were issued were the subject of very costly and time-consuming lawsuits because there were questions raised as to whether or not the agency satisfied its legal burden under TSCA to compel this type of testing. As you can imagine, toxicological testing is very costly. So not only if you are a manufacturer do you have to lay out the resources to conduct the testing, if you were the manufacturer of a chemical with a very lucrative product line, what would you not want that testing to yield? You don't want that testing to show that there's an adverse health effect associated with a particular product because we live in a very litigious society. And so if a product might now be associated with a particular adverse effect and it's been in commerce for the last 30 years, you could be subject not only to concerns with respect to your ability to continue to market that product, but you may be exposed to collateral liability for product liability under general theories of tort law. Or you might have downstream concerns from distributors and customers that you didn't fully disclose potential risks associated with your product. So the, the reason the Section 4 test rule is significant is it would possibly disclose adverse health effects or environmental effects that might lead to the diminution or deselection of your chemical and the entire product line on which it is based, and it might lead to collateral forms of liability from downstream customers and others here in the United States and elsewhere. So the one way the agency can get at additional opportunities for information on a chemical. And if you don't respond to a TSCA Section 4 test rule, you will be held liable for not satisfying your obligations under it. Um, yes? Suppose there's discrepancy between what manufacturer publishes test results and then say like peer-reviewed journal, journal articles that might draw different conclusions. Um, I realize that glyphosate, which is manufactured by Monsanto, is a pesticide, so it isn't controlled here, but right. That's a case where that happened, where Monsanto's reported um, endocrine disrupting effects did not align with some peer-reviewed journal articles that had also done studies on glyphosate. Obviously, that could result in a tort, but does the EPA have any sort of ability to take those peer-reviewed journal articles or other sources of information into consideration when implementing regulations or exercising their authority uh, under the new use rule? The gentleman asked, for those of you that may not have heard it, it let's say, for example, there's a peer-reviewed article that concludes glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is a herbicide manufactured by, among others, Monsanto and many others, because it's gone generic, um, suggests that there's a, an effect associated with exposure to the chemical that does not align with what the manufacturer claims are health effects. And the question is, under TSCA, this is a, probably not the greatest example right. because... EPA is another one. Well, FIFRA is, this is a FIFRA issue. 
But let's say, for example, it's not glyphosate. Let's just say it's hexylmethyl. That there's a peer-reviewed article on hexylmethyl that suggests there's an adverse health effect that is not otherwise aligning with what the manufacturer of hexylmethyl believes to be known adverse effects associated with this industrial chemical. Number one, first question is, is that information subject to submission to EPA? Well, if it's a peer-reviewed article that is publicly available, there's regulations under TSCA Section 8E that would dictate whether or not you have an obligation to submit that information to EPA. In some circumstances, you, if it's a government um, report, you can assume that the information is publicly available and you don't need to separately submit it. But if that information were so powerful, compelling, credible, and otherwise important that showed that a particular chemical did not align and was new information, the agency could absolutely take that information, rely upon it, and invoke authority that it has under TSCA Section 5 or TSCA Section 6, which we're getting to, to further limit, compel additional testing, or otherwise address um, the, the potential risk that that peer-reviewed study elicited with respect to that chemical, okay? Um, so we've gone off from task of the inventory, all of these opportunities for new information, what EPA can do, and that's how it can get to a Section 4 test rule. Uh, I already went forward this. Uh, there have been about 200 chemicals that have been subject to TSCA Section 4 test rules, okay? And often, chemical manufacturers, instead of just letting the test rule go final, because first the agency will issue a proposed test rule and then comment will be solicited on that. The manufacturers collectively get together. You don't have eight different chemical manufacturers doing eight separate neurotoxicity studies. They pool their resources and form consortia collectively to find the best representative sample of the substance and test it collectively. And they will do so according to basically a contract that they enter into with EPA called an enforceable consent agreement, according to which the testing must be done or there will be stipulated penalties under the consent agreement. Okay? So we've gone from getting all the information under our testing authorities to um, EPA going forward with the TSCA Section 4 test rule. And then what happens if concerns continue that the testing elicits additional concerns relating to a particular chemical, then this TSCA Section 6 authorizes EPA to address risks that are deemed to be unreasonable within the confines of the TSCA standard. And it can impose additional restrictions on the marketing of that chemical. It might be labeling restrictions, it might be full face or partial respiratory protection in the workplace. It might be full clothing, uh, Tyvek, rubber gloves. It might be requirements that downstream customers have to observe certain protective clothing and equipment requirements. It might be uh, diminished opportunities for release into the water if a chemical is thought to have certain persistent uh, viral accumulative or toxic effects called PBTs. So, the, our goal here in demonstrating this cascading authority that the agency has all springs from whether substance is listed on the inventory, certain reporting requirements that were required under TSCA Section 8, opportunities for EPA to compel additional testing, down to if the testing shows a risk that the agency believes to be unreasonable, the agency has authority under TSCA Section 6 to control those risks by mandating specific requirements, okay? These are just some of the things that the agency can do under TSCA Section 6. Um, labeling, record keeping, use. Um, only five substances have been restricted under Section 6 since the beginning of TSCA, which again is one of the concerns that have been raised in the context of TSCA reform. Like, let me get this right. There are 85,000 chemical substances listed on the inventory and only uh, five of them have been subject to Section 6 authorities. And in part, it's a long story. Um, the standard for regulating a chemical under TSCA Section 6 is quite high. So that's part of the concern, is just meeting the regulatory standard. One of the issues in TSCA reform 
is to revise the standard to make the agency's deployment of authority to control chemical risk easier to access. And the seminal case is uh, the agency tried to restrict certain exposures to asbestos, and the corrosion-proof fittings case um, them set out what is the legal standard EPA must meet, and it's quite stringent, because the agency was found not to have met its burden, and so these uh, asbestos uh, exposures were um, uh, not sustained by the Court of Appeals. Okay, we've gone through Tosca Section 5, 4, 6, and 8. There are other provisions of Tosca that we're not going to go into. If you import or export a chemical, Tosca Section 12 and 13 apply. There are all types of a variety of uh, record keeping reporting obligations that apply. What I'd like to do is just quickly go over some of the concerns that I have not already mentioned with regard to Tosca. As we said, there's no requirement for new chemicals that you generate data with respect to that chemical substance. Some people have expressed concern about that. There's no minimum data set required for existing chemicals. Some of the chemicals that were grandfathered some 30 years ago still have not been subject to mandatory testing by EPA. That doesn't mean the test data doesn't exist. And as you can imagine, chemical producers often maintain very strict standards for the development of their own chemicals. Uh, both efficacy and safety data. So it's not like these chemicals are unreviewed, it's just that the agency has not made the development of these data or the showing of a minimum data set a prerequisite to their continued manufacturing marketing. There have been very few chemicals, around 200, that have been subject to testing under Tosca Section 4, and it's not a lot. But as you can imagine, for the lawyers in the room and on the phone, a Section 4 test rule takes years to produce. And um, it, it is very costly to generate um, a proposed rule and a final rule and have it sustain judicial review. So the agency has backed off of those and, and opted into more voluntary data production programs like the High Production Volume Program or the VSEP program, and more recently the um, Nanomaterial Stewardship Program, which is a voluntary program. Uh, too few chemicals have been regulated under Tosca Section 6, as I said, only five to date. And some people assert that asserting confidential business information claims are too easily made and don't often uh, fully satisfy the requirements for maintaining information that would uh, frustrate a request for public disclosure. So overall, critique is how many of the 85,000 chemicals that are listed on the inventory have been assessed for safety. That's been one of the main drivers for Tosca reform over the years, and I'm going to suggest that you review these um, in your materials. I've listed just the various Tosca reform initiatives that have been going on for a number of years now, the pace of, of um, judicial, or excuse me, legislative inquiry into uh, Tosca reform has quickened uh, in the 2009, 10, and 11 time frame. We're now in mid-2012. There's renewed interest in trying to get something to happen before the election to amend Tosca. My own view is that the likelihood of that happening is not high, but hopes are, uh, because many of us are of the view that Tosca needs to be reformed. And uh, we would very much like our, our bipartisan friends on Capitol Hill in the House and Senate to move forward with doing that. Um, there's no dearth of information. Our own website contains copious amounts of information on Tosca reform initiatives. This is just a very skeletal outline of some of the core provisions that I'm not going to go through because as a practical matter, Senator Lautenberg's uh, S-847 is no longer the only game in town and there are new legislative initiatives that are floating around that may or more likely may not um, result in Tosca reform this year. And if it doesn't happen this year, it's anybody's guess on when it could happen. In the absence of Tosca reform, what are we seeing? Far more state initiatives. We have over 20 states that over the last several years have initiated their own chemical management um, initiatives to diminish or address exposures to chemicals that have, are of concern to various states. So many of us are of the view that this type of patchwork 
state by state uh, review of chemicals is not a good idea, that a unified, strong, and compelling, and scientifically defensible chemical management law is the way to go. Okay? Um, I'm also going to suggest that you take a look at some of the more recent developments with respect to nanotechnology, which has been a wonderful uh, incubator of, of EPA's authority under TSCA to address new chemicals that might be considered existing chemicals. And I'm not going to go into that because it's kind of complicated and I don't wish to confuse, but recognize that um, there's been an awful lot of work in the past seven years um, with respect to nanoscale chemicals, which is the engineering of chemicals at the molecular level to impart specific chemical and physical functionalities to make existing chemicals perform better or do chemicals uh, perform differently. Uh, and the agency has asserted its task authority over this class of chemicals in new and very innovative ways. The agency has also tried very hard to address chemicals of concern in ways that would enable it comprehensively to take a look at chemicals from a kind of holistic perspective. So the agency has tried to um, develop a chemicals of concern list through rulemaking, which has been not successful, clearing the OMB uh, hurdle. Um, EPA has been successful in issuing chemical action plans for classes of chemicals, phthalates, bisphenol A, long chain perfluorinated chemicals. Chemicals, that I think, for those of you that have reason to be aware of chemicals, you recognize that these are the ones that are kind of the all, this is the hit parade. Chemicals that are associated with one or several adverse effects, and the agency has developed plans for addressing them comprehensively under TSCA, put them out for public review, and enable stakeholders to either move forward or work with the agency in ways that will address these potential uh, risks. So that's a big development. Um, I won't go through that. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the chemical data reporting rule, which is um, the chemical data reports are due you know, to next month, so there will be a whole bunch of new information relating to existing chemicals publicly available later this year, okay? Lots of um, initiatives, too, with respect to EPA's concern that people are asserting confidential business information claims with respect to um, information that is not truly confidential. And so I know for our part, we urge all of our clients, if you're going to assert CBI, you make darn sure that you satisfy the criteria that those uh, data are truly confidential, they need to be protected, uh, they fall within the category of, of, of data that can be protected and are not otherwise out there. Sometimes we'll go on our clients' websites and see information there on the website that they're claiming is CBI. And it's like, dude, no. That is per se not <laughs> confidential because there it's on your website. But a lot of people do it reflexively because of the culture that has grown up around Tosca. Now people are much more circumspect and recognize that right to know, confidentiality, you really need to protect those data that are truly worth protecting. But if it's not confidential, don't assert a claim because you could be liable. All right, any questions on <laughs> Tosca? How significant do you think the deterrent effect of the Section 8 reporting requirements are given that um, litigants can use FOIA to get those reports and studies of, that the company has done. Um, I don't know, do you think that's, it? when we were talking earlier about what's been covered under TSCA and how many have been subject to Section 5 or Section 6, I mean, have a lot more been subject to Section 8? All chemicals are subject to Section 8, chemical okay. data reporting, assuming they meet the 25,000 pounds per site per chemical limitation. Okay. And the question is, are some of these reporting requirements a deterrent to chemical production depending upon what type of information is being disclosed? And the answer is absolutely. Because if you're required to divulge a lot of information about where your chemical is manufactured, in what quantities, to what constituencies might there be exposure, absolutely. You need to be very careful in how you quantify the information and how you disclose it to avert inferences that might flow if the data are not managed more pr protectively, okay? And the same goes with these chemicals that the agency has developed chemical action plans. If you're the manufacturer of a chemical 
phthalates, for example, that the agency has identified a chemical action plan on, that has a way of giving rise to inferences that might not in all cases be preferred by the chemical manufacturer because it's suggesting that this is a chemical of concern that under certain circumstances might pose risk and the agency is aware of that and is looking for opportunities to manage those risks. So the, the optics of information technology, the inferences that flow from the disclosure of information, the easy availability of toxicological information, the wealth of information that is available through the internet, through publicly available databases, through citizen activist groups, through all of the other stakeholders that are concerned about legitimately exposures to chemical all have to be managed by the producer, user, stakeholder community. And the, these forces are much more potent today with Twitter, Facebook, the internet, publicly available databases, much more available today than ever before. So information management and how you manage information about your chemical, about your product is hugely important. Okay? Let's, yes. Uh, with regard to the ease of, um, of bypassing the, uh, the new chemical um, review process after just 90 days and then um, given the heavy reliance on uh, just the good faith reporting of these chemical companies through section 8 or sorry section 5 um, what do you believe would be the best alternative or or I guess the best um, supplemental legislative initiative currently going through that could be a more comprehensive and enforceable um, regulation. The question is, um, and I want to correct whatever misinformation I may have, there are new chemical reporting obligations that are not taken lightly and they're not easy. If you are manufacturing a new chemical, you run significant risk if you do not run it through the process that EPA has created and get it reviewed and on the inventory. Um, and once it is on the inventory, you're, as I said, good to go. And, and similarly, for TOSCA Section 8, these reporting requirements are taken deadly seriously by EPA, and you are at considerable legal jeopardy if you do not, do not fulfill your reporting obligations. But I think your question goes to, given the fact that the grandfathering of many chemicals, the fact that under TOSCA Section 5, there's no requirement for new information or a minimum data set, might there be a better way to go? And I think some of the other uh, chemical reporting schemes that uh, we have been looking at hard over the years, the Canadian uh, chemical management approach and the European REACH approach are ways that we might better identify and correlate chemicals that are capable of posing risk with addressing those risks. Um, so I think new legislation would be focusing on trying to identify a universe of priority chemicals, those chemicals that are believed to pose the greatest risk, eliciting a minimum data set with regard to those chemicals, and then ensuring that whatever those uses are, maybe not just the chemical per se, but if particular uses are giving rise to adverse health effects or environmental effects, that we have opportunities sooner rather than later to identify what those risks are and impose a specific risk management approaches that would, would address those. And so there's a combination of looking at what is working out there in the world, and the Canadians have a really good program. There are elements of the European program that are worth looking at. Uh, but I do not think in all cases the European approach should be rolled over and applied here because that would not work either. And there are many aspects in the materials that you have that I would urge you to look at that are, have been the subject of considerable discussion on Capitol Hill and with stakeholders, and the goal is to try to make something happen sooner rather than later, because if we don't make TOSCA reform sooner rather than later, it probably is going to be a little irrelevant. Okay, let's quickly go through FIFRA. Who implements the program? Like TOSCA, FIFRA is not a delegated program. Um, you, if you had occasion to go to other of ELI's summer programs here, Air, water, and waste are delegated to the states once certain elements are satisfied. FIFRA and TOSCA are strictly managed by the United States Environmental Protection Agency here in Washington. Okay? So the Office of Pesticide Programs 
enforces FIFRA and, and implements it. There are various divisions that are set out here, depending upon what type of pesticide you have. And the Office of Pesticide Programs is actually located in Crystal City. It's not here um, on Washington or Constitution Avenue. It's physically separate, um, but it's nonetheless a, a centralized uh, program. There are a couple of states that have very mature state pesticide programs, California being the most extensive. So when you have your pesticide product reviewed and registered by EPA, you still have to have it reviewed and registered in every state in which your product is marketed. But only a handful of those states have very mature robust regulatory systems. The others are more revenue raisers by somebody getting a state label, paying a fee, and moving on. But California, New York, and Florida have pretty extensive programs, okay? What's a pesticide? It's defined very broadly, not unlike what we talked about in industrial chemicals. It's any substance or mixture intended to prevent, destroy, repel, or mitigate a pest, and a pest is very broadly defined. These are chemicals that are designed to achieve a certain biological functionality of killing, destroying, or preventing or mitigating a pest. So a substance is considered to be intended for a pesticidal purpose requiring registration if the person who distributes or sells it implies that the substance has a pesticidal functionality. Remember we talked about the Avon product? If you know your product has a pesticidal functionality and you're mentioning that and promoting it, that makes your chemical, whether you intended it to be a pesticide or not, a pesticide, and it has to be registered. The statutory authorities under FIFRA, and also there are some authorities under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that also relate to the regulation of pesticides, okay? The core programs include the registration of new active ingredients, products, and uses, um, Pesticides can be, as you know, applied to crops. They can be applied on your driveway. We talked about glyphosate and Roundup as being a, an herbicide. It kills weeds. Um, all of these products need to be registered by EPA as a precondition of their commercial uh, manufacture and distribution. Older chemicals, the pesticide program has been around since the 40s, so older chemicals have to be re-registered and are continually required to meet new product safety standards that EPA issues. Um, there are certain exemptions for um, research, but for the most part, if you are engaging in a pesticidal activity by manufacturing them or, or exporting them, you need to get these approved by EPA and registered. Um, and there are also extensive worker protection requirements that are administered by the Office of Pesticide Programs to ensure that people who are administering pesticides in the field and other uh, contexts are fully covered and protected from risks that, that might uh, uh, be posed. Also, there's much interplay, uh, interplay between uh, the Endangered Species Act and EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs uh, because of the application of chemicals into the environment that could adversely impact habitats or species uh, that to which they were, were not intended to address. A regulatory program is pretty straightforward. Any pesticide must be subject to pre-market review and approval. And it's a risk-based safety standard for non-food uses or chemicals for which there's no food use. There's a, no unreasonable risk to human health or the environment. And for a food use, for a chemical that might have a residue that uh, exist on a food crop or processed food, uh, there's a reasonable certainty of no harm. So these are very stringent standards that have been uh, defined and interpreted by uh, EPA in the courts for many years. The burden is on the registrant to prove your product is safe. This is very dissimilar from the safety standard under TSCA where the burden is on EPA to prove that it isn't safe. So there's a very, very strenuous burden if you are a manufacturer of, a, of an ingredient that you wish to register as a pesticide to prove that it is safe, which is the opposite of Tosca, where the burden is on EPA to prove that it isn't. Another concern that has been raised with Tosca. 
Uh, unlike Tosca 2, if you have a chemical that you wish to register as a pesticide, there are many, many upfront testing requirements that apply. Whole battery of tests that need to be uh, met according to uh, GOP standards. It's a very data-rich, data-intensive, costly undertaking to register a new active ingredient, or AI, as they're called in the trade. There are certain waivers that you can get if you have a use site that doesn't require a certain kind of data. But by and large, if you are in the business of making a pesticide, which includes, includes antimicrobials that are embedded products in paint cans to prevent mold and mildew, so pesticides cover a wide swath of commercial products, uh, you're looking at a long and costly proposition for developing data to prove that it's safe. Okay? Here's a typical label. Every word on the label on a pesticide, if you go through Walmart or any of the stores that market pesticides, uh, every single word here is approved by EPA. It's um, a process that you go through to negotiate your artwork. Uh, signal words, active ingredient disclosure, warning statements, use directions, approved claims, and ingredients. Every single word is carefully reviewed and considered by EPA and the registrant. There's nothing incidental about these labels. New active um, product uses, um, let's say you have a brand new active ingredient. An active ingredient is that chemical that is actually the, the portion of your product, pesticide product, that imposes the pesticidal properties. It's usually in some relatively trivial amount in an active ingredient. If you look at glyphosate, for example, it will be 0.02 of glyphosate and then the rest are considered inert ingredients, water and other um, surfactants and other ingredients that are not pesticidal. They're, they're called inerts because they are not pesticidal. They're not called inerts because they have no activity. Um, and that's, again, one of the concerns that have been raised for many years in the pesticide community because inerts are usually not subject to disclosure and people might want to know, well, besides the active ingredient, what's in that product formulation? And you're able to keep that from public disclosure unless and until EPA changes the rules. But for every chemical that you wish to have registered by EPA, this Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, or PREA, dictates how long the agency can take to review and approve a use for a new ingredient. For example, if you have a brand new active ingredient, you spent 10 years developing a brand new product, you might have $10 million invested in supporting that label, that, I mean, that, that registration. EPA, for depending upon the use and depending upon what type of pesticide it is, PREA, the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, will tell you how long EPA has to take to review and approve it. It could be 36 months, could be longer, could be less. But your data package, all of the data, all of the information you need, it gets submitted to EPA, and PREA will dictate how long the agency can spend in reviewing your application. And unlike TSCA, you have to pay a fee, a fairly substantial fee, for EPA's review and approval of the process uh, of the product. Under TSCA, it's $2,500 per PMN. Under FIFRA, you could spend a six-digit amount, $200,000, $100,000, on a new active ingredient. Because you're, the theory is you're paying for the agency review time. And if it's a 36-month review time, you're going to pay more than the agency's consideration of a single new use on a label that might take three months. Okay, So it's kind of a pay-as-you-go uh, process. Um, as noted, existing active ingredients, all the pesticides that have been reviewed previously are subject to re-review in staggered intervals to make sure the agency is aware of new information that would lead the agency to revisit its determination that this chemical is safe when used as intended. There are different types of opportunities that the agency has constructed over the years to promote newer, greener, less toxic chemicals. So the safer or reduced risk pesticide alternative, you're entitled to reduced fees 
expedited reviews and uh, dedicated resources with an EPA because the agency is trying to incentivize the development of safer, reduced risk pesticides by charging less and processing them faster. Okay? Uh, and there are other various programs that the agency has developed over the years, including minimum risk pesticides. These are pesticides under the statute that are presumptively thought not to pose the type of adverse biological or environmental impact that more traditional, conventional pesticides might. So again, there is a different program to promote the use of those chemicals and not deplete limited agent, agency resources on reviewing them when they are presumptively thought to be safer and better. The agency has a whole toolbox of enforcement authorities to um, stop the marketing of illegal pesticides, pesticides that don't reflect what the label says, for example. It's often, the, every label is accompanied by what is called a confidential statement of formula that is not public. And if a manufacturer uses some other source of active ingredient that is not aligned with that which is on file, it is considered unregistered and subject to restriction of sale, embargoing, and, and other civil and criminal penalties. So the agency can issue a stop sale if upon review it determines that the active ingredient you said is in your product is actually different than what's there. That will be immediately subject to enforcement repercussions. Uh, some recent developments, I think near and dear to me is the agency's approval late um, last year of the new, the first new nanopesticide, uh, the high Q application of a silver-based antimicrobial pesticide in, in, in approved for preservatives and textiles. Uh, the NRDC sued EPA, challenging the approval of that pesticide um, uh, earlier this year, and it's now being litigated in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. And if anyone is interested, all the briefs um, we have them, be happy to share. Very interesting topic. Again, it's a confluence of this is a new pesticide. The agency took the position that when it's manufactured at the nano scale, it is new and had to be re registered as a new active ingredient, even the silver has been registered in various forms uh, for at least 50 years. So EPA took that position as a matter of policy. HiQ went through the drill after four or five years um, and after the submission of significant information and now it's still, still being litigated in the Ninth Circuit. So that's an important case to watch because it's as much a challenge of EPA's review and approval of, of a, a, a nano pesticide as it is whether or not um, nano pesticides generally are going to you know, have a, a market life. A um, couple of other decisions here, the, the record bank user decision, um, EPA had imposed some restrictions through a risk management decision review of a rodenticide and the registrant said we don't agree with that, we're not going to abide by these risk management provisions. And EPA said, if you don't abide by them, we're going to consider your product misbranded and you would be subject to enforcement if you didn't do what we said. And the registrant said, no, your recourse, EPA, is to cancel us. You can't impose risk management decisions by considering it misbranded. You must go through a cancellation proceeding, which is a very long, costly proceeding. Uh, Record Bank Keyser won that case, and EPA was, was uh, found that it couldn't use its enforcement authority under misbranding theories to impose risk management decisions with which the registrant disagreed that the proper venue for sorting those out was through a cancellation proceeding. Um, there are a couple of other uh, decisions and initiatives that are listed here. I don't have time to go through them because I promised I was going to stop at 145, but there is one initiative in particular that the agency was seeking to use the functional equivalent of the 8E adverse effects reporting requirement. We talked about that under TSCA, which is if you're a registrant and you have information that would lead you and others to conclude that your chemical might pose risks about which EPA is unaware, you have to immediately submit that information to EPA under 8E. Well, FIFRA has the same reporting obligation under uh, uh, under, um, under FIFRA, it's called it FIFRA Section 682, 
and EPA was wanting to use its authority to compel the submission of information under FIFRA, Section 6A2, if the manufacturer of a registron had reason to believe that any part of its pesticide product contained a nanoscale ingredient, or any ingredient, either active or inert, was manufactured at the nano range. And that, I think it's been at OMB now a long time, uh, and probably not likely to see issuance and final because of the concern that you shouldn't really be using an adverse effects reporting tool to obtain information regarding particle size of a chemical substance in, in a product. But again, it's the agency's legitimate interest in trying to get information relating to chemical components and properties of chemicals that you know, are not easy to get, particularly under, under TSCA. Much easier to get information under FIFRA, because the agency has authority under FIFRA Section 3 to compel the submission of new information through a data call-in. Uh, if you're a registrant, a DCI is issued, you have to submit information alone or with others responsive to that request. It's, there's no counterpart for that under TSCA. So, the information gathering techniques for pesticides are more extensive than they are for industrial chemicals, which is one of the reasons why in this TSCA reauthorization debate, some people are saying, well, why don't we just have a use kind of approach that we have under FIFRA, uh, under, under FIFRA and impose that under TSCA? Well, the difference is there are about maybe 1,200, 1,300 active ingredients registered under FIFRA and thousands more under under TSCA. So the economies of scale are such that that approach likely would not work. Yes? Um, two questions, why is FIFRA so much stronger? Uh, and the second question is, I'm sure plenty of people have thought of this, but why aren't all chemicals regulated under what seems to be a stricter FIFRA instead of having TSCA and FIFRA? They're all chemicals. Uh, the, the question is, you know, why is that? Why is the standard under FIFRA seemingly more robust and the registration process more robust than it is under TSCA? Um, and I think one, one answer is look at what you're looking at under FIFRA. You're looking at chemicals with a biological potency that are intended to kill. They're intended to repel. They're intended to do something icky if you're on the receiving end of the application. Industrial chemicals, you know, some of them never see the light of day. They're completely consumed in a manufacturing process. They might be embedded in some substrate that prevents exposure entirely. Uh, the universe of entities subject to the chemical might be just workers who are fully protected. So there, there are many different reasons why the chemical systems are entirely different. But I think a big one is FIFRA it is intended to address known risk relating to chemicals that are intended to have a biological potency that has a very extreme effect on certain critters. And the burden has always been under FIFRA to demonstrate the safety of your product. TSCA, the burden is on the chemical producer to you know, complete all the paperwork, but EPA must make the finding that the chemical is not not safe, or it presents unreasonable risk to human health and the environment. So the, the burden is an issue, the biological potency is an issue, and the fact that the chemical programs and the regulatory constructs are just entirely different. A very good question, and I think many are now wishing that the, the approach to chemical regulation with burden certainly should be on the chemical producer. I think most in the chemical community, including the American Chemistry Council, believe that the burden should be on the producer to demonstrate that its chemical is safe when used as intended. And not surprisingly, even if that burden were not to shift because of the U.S. system of product liability, tort liability, you can be compliant with TSCA and your chemical might pose a risk and you're still going to get sued. So there's every reason in the world why chemical producers and product manufacturers that have a very significant chemical component to their products make damn sure that those chemicals are safe because the consequences of failure are extreme in the United States because of our very litigious society. Yes? Yeah, along the same line, I mean, it seems like TSCA is much more upstream 
whereas Stifra deals with more of like a downstream consumer product. Is there a sort of an analog with uh, chemicals that are consumer products that are not uh, rodenticides or fungicides? I mean, it, uh, that is effectively regulating that world? Well, you know, we, you, there are products that are regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, right. um, but not really. I mean, I, I know what you're saying. But right. the, space, the question is, you know, FIFRA, the other important distinction that I probably <coughs> neglected to focus on, and I, and I you need to do this we're, and think about it very carefully. Once a chemical is on the inventory under TSCA, it is there, and that chemical can be used in any particular application without EPA review. Under FIFRA, going back to our glyphosate or triclosan or any phenol, whatever the chemical might be, if you are wanting to use that chemical under FIFRA, but it is not approved for that use, you have to go back to EPA and get it approved for that use. So. Under TASCA, it's a chemical regulatory program. Under FIFRA, it's a chemical use. So there's much more um, management and control and regulation over specific applications of the chemical, which make for a very kind of tight regulatory construct. But again, the number of chemicals under FIFRA is much, much reduced. I think it's maybe 12 or 1,300, and I wish I had that, but. I think you get a sense of the order of magnitude here. There are those number of active ingredients, and again, there might be many more chemical products because every active ingredient could have 20, 30, 40 products that are derivative of them, of different concentrations, different application, different use sites. They're all separately registered. There's no parallel universe under TSCA. And so for further downstream on the product front, You've got you know, certain products that are regulated under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that might be subject to regulation. Cosmetics, for example, that make certain health plans are subject to the FFDCA. Food additives are subject to regulation under the FFDCA. Medical devices, but there are products that might be marketed that don't, again, subsequently get subject to an EPA or an FDA or a Consumer Product Safety Act review. Um, that's not to say that there are inherent risks that are undetected. It just means that there are other regulatory systems that are intended to mitigate and, or identify and, and mitigate those, but not nearly as strenuously as a, a TSCA or a FIFRA or an FFDCA approach. Those are our core product, chemical product authorities. Question. Okay, question. Can Lynn talk more about the scope of use under TSCA Section 8A as a trigger for companies that don't manufacture or import chemicals? Well, I think if you don't manufacture or uh, import a chemical, you're not a manufacturer, and so the burden of an 8A reporting obligation is going to fall on others, people that are manufacturers or importers of that chemical. And the, the pair rule that we talked about in, in our materials um, are going to be enforced against those entities by virtue of a Federal Register notice that would come out and tell you who is subject to the rule, what information is being elicited, by when must it be submitted, and that's the beginning and end of the pair. If it's the chemical data reporting rule, again, you need to be subject, you need to be a chemical data manufacturer or importer in order to be subject to the, um, uh, the chemical data reporting rule. And so if you're a downstream purchaser or processor of a chemical, your obligations are going to be non-existent under the pair rule or much less under the chemical data reporting rule. And I can, I can certainly follow up uh, Catherine, if that would be of help, um, since we're running out of time here, but there we've got all kinds of information on how those uh, reporting functionalities might impact companies that are not actual manufacturers. But I think I, I tried to emphasize how EPA is much more aware of the big commercial space between the, a manufacturer or an importer and all of the chemical 
constituencies and stakeholders in the value chain is often chemicals go from one producer to a processor to another processor to another processor to an entity that then incorporates it into a product that might incorporate it into another product and then it goes out into the marketplace. And what requirements attach to what entity in that value chain are increasingly less clear than they used to be. But for the most part, these reporting functionalities fall on the manufacturer and the uh, importer of the chemical and not on a lot of the entities that are between that part of the process and the time it's actually marketed and out the door. Other questions? Yes. I was curious under Tosca, when EPA requests an in, a manufacturer or an industry to assess a chemical that they think may be an issue, mm -hmm. did they actually lay out the framework for how that should be tested or do they let the manufacturer or whoever develop that on their own? That's a very good question. Um, if, for example, EPA has looked at information that it's collected under TOSCA Section 8A or the Chemical Data Reporting Rule or 8C or 8D or AE, and it says, you know what, we're a little concerned about this chemical, it might issue a TOSCA Section 4 test rule. Often what happens is the producers of that chemical will get together with <coughs> antitrust counsel in hand and say, you know what, we've got a better way of assessing what the concerns might be might be more streamlined testing, it might be opportunities for high throughput testing, it might be ways to diminish animal testing. So it is very much um, a negotiated process. Either in the old days when EPA actually issued TOSCA Section 4 test rules, you could report back in the form of comments that no, you really shouldn't do a two generation reproductive tox study here, why don't we do it this way? Now, if the agency has these concerns, the better preferred way is to negotiate with the agency, even if it doesn't rise to the occasion of an enforceable task of Section 4, uh, the proposed or final test rule. Because if the agency is saying, look, we're concerned. We think there's something here. You, you don't want to blow those concerns off. You want to either educate EPA that this was based on misinformation or inadequate information, or acknowledge that there is a better way to go about fully defining the biological potencies of this chemical and negotiate a proposed consent order and then you would follow the steps and the testing regime specified in the contract that you negotiate with EPA and as I said if you don't meet the targets or renegotiate new targets you're subject to stipulated penalties under the order. So by and large the object of the exercise is to get to yes efficiently and quickly and relying upon the best possible science. Um, and that's usually a negotiated opportunity between the producer community and the scientists at EPA. Okay? All right, we are at the bewitching hour, 2 o'clock. I want to thank you all on the phone and in the room for being a very attentive audience. And I'm happy, 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 happy to respond to any questions that you may have. We have a ton of information on our website, many articles and other useful resources that I urge you to look at. We just, very data rich, lots and lots of stuff. But if I've confused you or left you hanging, please give me a call, happy to help. Thank you all very much. Thank you.